This year happens to be the 250th anniversary of Ludwig van Beethoven, who is not so very different from many artists and musicians today. He was a freelancer for the 35 years that he lived here in Vienna. There wasn't a guarantee that he'd receive a steady income from a patron, much less from the state. As with many artists throughout history, he composed some of the greatest works known to man under a great deal of financial stress. This leads to broader questions. What value should we place on the arts, and should they be publicly funded? What would Hayek say? I'm Scott Nelson with the Austrian Economic Center and Hayek Institute in Vienna, Austria, and this week we're going to take a look at the arts and what Hayek has to say about public funding for the arts. So we've done a lot of videos on aspects of monetary theory and politics, and I thought it'd be nice to talk about something a little different, but no less important. Hayek, I think, would approve as well. Warning of the dangers of specialization, Hayek once said that in the study of society, exclusive concentration on a speciality has a peculiarly baneful effect. It will not merely prevent us from being attractive company or good citizens, but may impair our competence in our proper field. He goes on to say famously, nobody can be a great economist who is only an economist. And I'm even tempted to add that the economist who is only an economist is likely to become a nuisance, if not a positive danger. Well, we wouldn't want to be a nuisance or a danger, so let's be good economists and citizens and attractive company by talking about the arts. When it comes to public funding for the arts, Hayek is not necessarily opposed, although he would probably be in support of temporary funding. If an institution is permanently funded, then Hayek would fear that it would become an extension of government whose productions are subject, therefore, to government approval. Moreover, such conditions are always ripe for corruption. In any case, Hayek believes as well that the government should not be the sole provider of things such as cultural amenities, fine arts, preservation of natural beauty, etc. But why is this? Much like any other area, whether it be healthcare or infrastructure or what have you, Hayek believes that the private sector should have a shot at seeing what it can offer, the private sector generally being more efficient than the public sector. But efficiency. That's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting because in the case of the arts, what exactly do they produce? It would turn out far more than you'd think. And we're not talking just about Beethoven and Mozart here, Beethoven and Mozart being Hayek's two favorite composers. The arts cover all types of aesthetics. Consider the movies you watch, the music you listen to, the fiction books that you read. Consider photography. If you like video games, then consider the fact that computer graphics are art. Consider that designers of everything, from furniture to clothing, are artists. Many design specifications aim not just at functionality, but also at beauty. Consider this tie that I'm wearing. It's bedecked with fleur-de-lis, most commonly associated with France, but also with Florence, which is where I happen to have purchased it. It serves very little purpose, apart from imparting a veneer, I suppose, of respectability and seriousness to what I happen to be saying to you. Apart from that, though, it exercises a great offense against my neck. Now, it may just happen that over time, ties go out of fashion, they're no longer found to be beautiful, or suits themselves might go out of fashion, and I might be seated here more comfortably before you. But until that point, I remain constricted. Many of these changes in culture, artistic taste, and fashion were spontaneous. They're yet another example of Hayekian spontaneous order, as pointed out in a previous video by my colleague Kai. For this reason, and because beauty is so often in the eye of the beholder, arts are in many ways an ideal case of where the free market should be left to work, so that individuals can decide which initiatives and which works are truly beautiful or aesthetically pleasing or valuable. The state can play a role here as one among many actors, but Hayek's view is that if we truly believe something is valuable, such as the arts, then instead of mobilizing the state to support it through coercion, we should put our money where our mouth is and support it ourselves patiently and faithfully through voluntary associations. Hayek even speculates at one point about having a hundred or one thousand people chosen at random and given fortunes so that they can pursue whatever projects they want. 
I wouldn't necessarily vouch for the validity or usefulness of such an idea, but it does point to an essential need for the furtherance of arts and civilization. Namely, the need for people who can back their beliefs financially. Or, to put it another way, there's a need for the financially able to back good beliefs, or at least artistic, cultural, and educational projects, much as the Medici or Fugger families of the Renaissance, or the Rockefellers more recently. How do the rich today spend their money? Are they spending it in a way that is of value to society? But here we run up against the problem of how we determine value to society. On this matter, Hayek says, and I quote, it is highly misleading if we say, for example, that a man who supplies matches to millions and thereby earns $200,000 a year is worth more to society than a man who supplies great wisdom or exquisite pleasure to a few thousand and thereby earns $20,000 a year. Even the performance of a Beethoven sonata, a painting by Leonardo, or a play by Shakespeare have no value to society, but a value only to those who know and appreciate them. And it has little meaning to assert that a boxer or a crooner is worth more to society than a violin virtuoso or a ballet dancer if the former renders services to millions and the latter to a much smaller group. The point is not that the true values are different, but that the values attached to the different services by different groups of people are incommensurable. All that these expressions mean is merely that one in fact receives a larger aggregate sum from a larger number of people than the other. So we keep going in a bit of a circle, don't we? Saying that we should fund the arts publicly, but especially privately because they are valuable, but without any objective way of measuring value, since different things have different values to different people, and these values can change over time. Is what is valuable what is beloved by many at this present moment? Or does value show itself only in the long run, in terms of what lasts over many, many, many years? Take the Iliad, or the Odyssey by Homer. These epic poems have been around for more than two and a half millennia. Part of that is due to historical accident. Who knows how many wonderful artistic works we've lost over the years. It also makes me wonder which of our artistic productions in the 21st century will last millennia. But much of Homer's longevity is owing to the fact that he speaks movingly about human nature and human drama. This is why we can read him and understand all too well when he speaks about love, or anger and revenge, or about the longing for home. In modern society, we're fixated on the short term. Think of the news, for example. Daily updates on the latest outrages or tragedies that have befallen us. Or think of quarterly reports and our love of quantifiable data. And it makes sense. If we like the short term, it's because, as Hayek's rival John Maynard Keynes famously said, in the long run, we're all dead. If we like quantifiable data, it's because quantities are more easily measured. They're not perfect, but they are at least some benchmark that we can use to determine whether it's worth putting our money into something or not, whether a venture is doing well, growing, or not. And this is one of the problems with art of the higher variety. And I'm not talking about the design on my tie. I mean the artistic productions of a Homer or a Beethoven. They're beautiful, and yet, by many quantitative measures, useless. And it's to Hayek's great credit that he was always focused on the long term, not immediate utilitarian benefits. Because it's precisely in distancing ourselves from this utilitarian thinking, the thinking that says that the only endeavors worth undertaking must have a clearly defined function, it's only from distancing ourselves from this kind of thinking that we see the true value in art, that we see that value and functionality are not synonymous. The British philosopher Sir Roger Scruton was renowned, amongst many other things, for his work on aesthetics. Scruton lamented the ugliness of much of modern architecture. Once an ugly modern building has outlived the function for which it had originally been built, it stands derelict. After all, no one wants to live or work in an ugly building. Whereas if it had been built with greater consideration for beauty, 
for its aesthetic value, then it could likely be reused for a different function. Ironically, an exclusive concern for utility can make an object useless in the long run, whereas concern for beauty or for art or for something that appears useless in the short run can make an object useful for all time. At the outset of this video, I asked another question, what value should we place on the arts? Well, it would turn out quite a lot of value. Indeed, the arts, as Hayek recognized, are far too valuable to be left to the public sector alone. Value, understood not just in terms of function, quantifiable data, and short-run considerations, but also in terms of aesthetics and what might appear to be useless. In line with Hayek's quote at the beginning about how nobody can be a great economist who is only an economist, I hope in talking a bit about the arts and the useless, you have also become a better economist. So go out and spend your money on something useless. It might come in handy one day. And that's what Hayek would say. This guy is awesome. He's got a lot of great stuff to say. I hope you've really been enjoying our videos. If you have, and if you'd like to hear what Hyde has to say about something else, anything, then let me know in the comments. And please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends.